Hey, what's up guys? My name is Sophia. I go by Kia Nocturne online and I'm here to talk to you about sculpting. I really love clay and I want to share that with you guys. Um, so some of my past projects that have involved sculpting pretty heavily is um, a character called Mauricio from Inoboku. Um, that's what I have as an example up here. I've got the actual finished piece and um, also pieces of the mold. Um, I've also got something in the Cosplay Museum that showcases a lot of my sculpting as well and uh, cast resin pieces. So um, that middle image is from Soul Calibur. It's Tira's foot armor from Soul Calibur 5. Um, the next image right over there is also from Soul Calibur. It's from, it's a Pierre Omega's arm um, from Soul Calibur 5. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that here, but you can kind of see the sculpt from here. Um, all of these are sculpted using monster clay. That's my weapon of choice, but um, I'll be talking about a lot of different types of clays and ways to use them in cosplay in this panel. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and start with clay types and materials and tools around that. So there's a lot of different types of clay, um, and I'll walk you through kind of the brand names as well as kind of um, descriptions, what you use them for, what they're good for. Um, so polymer clays are pretty easy to find. You can find these at um, craft stores, Michaels, Joann's even. Um, polymer clays are Vimo, Sculpey, that includes original Sculpey, Sculpey Firm, Sculpey 3, Primo Sculpey. Um, and there's a lot of different types of polymer clays as well. These are just kind of ones that um, I think are really good. Um, they've got different uh, varying like firmnesses. Um, so they're very versatile. Um, so it's not really a clay. It's made out of PVC and plasticizer. Um, but it can be hardened by baking in the uh, oven or you can fire it in the kiln, but most of us at home probably don't have a kiln, so um, bake it in an oven. I use this mainly for small accessories um, or you can use it as a master to uh, make your piece and then mold and cast it later. Um, so some pros here are you can harden it by baking, so it's pretty accessible, um, it's pretty economical, it's really it's pretty inexpensive, it's pretty beginner friendly as well. And as I mentioned earlier, you can get it in some varying firmnesses. And, uh, yeah, varying firmnesses. So I'll get into the firmness a little bit later, but just trust me, it's, it's the thing that you want. Um, some cons, uh, if you don't mold and cast it out of resin or plastic, um, is that if you do use that uh, baked piece, it's pretty heavy. And if you're, you build up the density pretty high and it's, it's not hollow, pretty heavy. If you drop it, it'll break pretty easily. It's pretty brittle. Um, and there is some shrinkage. So if you're making a piece to fit into another piece, um, then there will there will be some shrinkage there that you have to account for. Um, I forget the percentage exactly. So I actually did make that mistake on this, this piece. Um, dude, it's kind of a little bit of a rush job with the horns. Um, the original sculpt did not have um, the horns attached to it just because it's really difficult to mold something and cast something with like protruding pieces out of it. So I made that uh, to be separated or separate. And so um, the intent was to cast that, these horns also out of um, the monster clay so there'd be no shrinkage and then cast that in a plastic and glue that on. Ran out of time, you know, as cosplayer does. And so I ended up making them out of Sculpey and making them, um, you can't really tell here, but the actual, uh, base of this has holes in here for the um, the horns to go into and because I was trapped for, for time and had to switch over to using Sculpey for the horns um, the holes don't really match up so that's just something to look out for when you're working with Sculpey um, it's it will shrink and you have to account for that um, one of my favorite clays to use is oil-based clay. Um, this is sulfur-free clay, uh, monster clay is my favorite to use, and then the next standard is Shabbat plasticine clay. You'll see this used a lot in um, like special effects. It's not uh, monster clay isn't the standard, but Shabbat is, um, and this is pretty like hard. It doesn't dry. It doesn't cure. Um, at the end, I'll have you guys come up and you can kind of play with it and like kind of feel what it feels like. This is one firmness. They have a couple different types of firmnesses, which I'll again get into a little bit later. Um, but this is my weapon of choice in general. So Monster Clay or Shabon Clay, um, two different brands. 
um, is like clay mixed with wax or oil, so it's never going to dry, it's never going to harden, um, and it's got a really low melting point. It can be softened and softened and melted into molds, or you can manipulate it to make different uh, effects. Um, so it's really good for detail heavy and large pieces as the master sculpt. You do have to mold and cast this because it doesn't dry, so you do have to have or understand how to do that as well. And I'll, there's a portion at the end that I'll walk you through how I made my pieces out of plastic um, from that master sculpt. So some pros is it doesn't harden, so the work time is literally forever. Um, you have varying firmnesses in both the monster clay and the chavant, which will help uh, building detail. Um, it's very versatile just because of those two things. Um, some cons are that you have to know how to mold and cast because you need to mold and cast these to get a usable product for your cosplay. The next thing I'm going to talk about is water-based clay. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with water-based clay. Uh, Laguna wet clay would be the um, standard here. And then I also listed paper clay here because it's accessible, but I don't necessarily recommend it. It's not super beginner friendly and it's got its own kind of like pros and cons as well. So the Laguna wet, wet clay um, is clay mixed with mineral oil to extend the clay's drying time. Um, and it's developed for Walter E. Disney and also known as EM217. Um, and it's usually used for detailed sculptures and then molded and casted in, um, in a more durable material, just like the oil-based clay. I don't recommend using it as a final product just because it, it does dry to, you don't have to mold it and cast it, but it is very heavy. Um, and it's hard to use as well. So some pros here are, it's very similar to oil-based clay, so if you're used to using that, or if you want to go into that route, um, they're pretty similar. Um, very versatile and it's very economical. It's pretty, it's pretty inexpensive if you can find it. It is relatively hard to find though. I was able to find some um, on Amazon shipped from a seller. Um, I don't know any places locally where I can get it personally. It may be different for wherever you guys are from, um, but I've had a hard time finding the red, red clay. I have some at home that I want to experiment with and see if I like it better than my oil-based clay or if I'm going to stick with oil-based clay. So some cons are it dries out. Obviously, it's water-based, so the water evaporates. Um, it's not beginner-friendly. Um, and then once, if you're building something very large, like a bust um, or a, a full-scale sculpture, sculpture, it'll start to sag and it separates easily. Um, there's just a ton of moisture in there. Um, and just because of that, I mean, you need to mold it and you need to cast it um, in a more durable product. Paper clay is water-based clay mixed with fiber or paper. I have this listed on here, not necessarily because it's something I recommend to you guys, um, but if you are a beginner and you are using a lot of paper products like paper mache, this is a good way to go um, just because it works really well with paper mache. And it's not easy to use, but it's, the learning curve is not super, super steep. So once you get a hang of it, then it's really easy to work with. It is susceptible to drying out again because it is um, water based. Um, and so it will crack and it will shrink as it dries out. But basically the way you work with that is um, as it's dry, you just fill in those gaps and just keep doing that as it dries. Um, and yeah, it works out pretty well. So it's best used for like small topical details. Uh, it's really great when you're working with paper mache, uh, pops and armor, and it's super, super porous when it's dry. So that's sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing. So some pros here are it's similar to polymer clay. Um, and it's super, super accessible and economical. You can get this stuff from Michael's Hobby Lobby. Um, I think even Joanne's. It's super, super light when it dries. Because it is like paper pulp, basically, with some like fiber in there, um, it's super light. And the porousness, it, that's, it all kind of makes it really light. There's a lot of air bubbles in it. So it's almost like a foam in which it, um, the same concept as a foam is that the reason why it's light is because there's a ton of bubbles in there. Um, it makes it really difficult when it comes to actually painting it though, because you'll need to cover it with something that will fill in those gaps and those holes so that you can get like a nice smooth finish. So some cons there are that it does crack when it dries, so you have to watch it. It does shrink a lot um, and it's super, super porous, which I was saying before, you just go ahead and 
sand it down, fill it with a filler primer, um, Mod Podge, wood glue, anything like that, and keep sanding until you get your desired, um, your desired kind of finish. The next thing I'm going to talk about um, are compounds. So there are a couple things that I like to use. I like to use epoxy sculpt a lot, um, and then I have a friend who's really good at freeform air. These aren't necessarily clays, um, but I wanted to talk to them because they are popular things to use within the cosplay community, and um, they, they have their uses and they have their purposes. I also have foam clay in here as well. So epoxy clays are two parts, and they're foam. They are mixed to form like a clay-like su uh, substance. And Epoxy Sculpt is a brand name. Again, Reform Air is also a brand name. And they're made for extended use, and they will self-cure. Um, so when they're cured, they're super, super hard and super, super durable. They don't shrink too much, but they do shrink a little bit. Um, and I find that they're best used for reinforcement to an existing piece, um, or to do, or to make kind of like add-on pieces to a sculpt or um, another cosplay armor piece that needs to be super, super durable. Like a spike, if you don't mind the heaviness of it, it's, it I've used it for like claws and spikes and stuff like that. Um, some pros are that it's harder and more durable than plastic. It air cures. It's not really drying in that it, it's, it's an actual cure. Um, it is a two-part compound. So there is a chemical reaction happening in there. Um, and you can also achieve a really smooth finish quickly. It's not super, super porous. Some cons, though, is it doesn't take detail as, as easily as the other clays I've mentioned, and it's pretty heavy, um, it's very dense, and it does sag. If you're making something really large um, and very dense, it will sag as you're sculpting, so I don't recommend it for making something really any larger than your hand. And I'm not sure if you'd want to do that either, because it'd end up really, really heavy when it's cured. Um, foam clay is a putty-like substance that has the texture of EVA foam. Um, and it's not a clay at all, it's definitely just a compound. It doesn't have clay in it at all. And it's super, super popular right now because we use it for filler for like foam armor and props. Um, it's also nice to only have to deal with one surface layer texture when you're making an armor piece. So it's really convenient for making spikes and um, details on top of like a foam base. And you all you have that same texture throughout so you can treat it the same. So it's really, it's really great in that respect. Um, some pros are that it hardens by itself. You don't need to bake it or do anything special. It's super lightweight when it dries, and it's really easy to use, and it has the same texture as EVA foam when it's dry. Um, some cons here is it doesn't take detail like traditional clay does. Um, it acts kind of, if you've ever used Mold Magic, yeah, Mold Magic. Um, is it called Mold Magic? Model, Model Magic. Magic, sorry. Um, it's it's kind of like fluffy like that, so like you make an indentation and it kind of puffs back out. Um, so it's a little bit harder to put fine detail in it, but if you're only trying to make like a base structure or like a spike or like um, like some swirly details, it's perfect for that. Okay, the next thing I'm going to talk about are some tools that I use. Um, just a little overview here because this is this is a lot. Um, there are in times where I use solvents to break down um, some of the clay, and that helps um, with details. I also use heat for the same thing, and then armatures and supports, exactly what it sounds like. Basically, before you build your clay sculpture, you're going to want to build something to support that inner structure um, of it. Um, that also helped in the mold making piece as well, and then some tools. Uh, you've got like your hands, ribbon loop tools, uh, ball tools, shapers, and wooden plastic tools. So I'll talk about those in a second. So some solvents. So polymer clay, um, the solvent for polymer clay is isopropyl alcohol, 91%. It's super, super abrasive. Um, I use this a lot for finishing. So you basically take like a paintbrush, um, put some alcohol on it, paint it on, and then it will break down some of that clay, um, almost melt it a little bit, and that makes it really easy to take away clay or manipulate clay, it makes it really, really soft. Um, it's super abrasive, so be careful, don't use a lot, uh, or you may completely dissolve your, <laughs> your piece. 
Um, Oil-based clay, you can also use isopropyl alcohol, but I don't really recommend it. It's not super abrasive and it does leave kind of this weird residue. Um, what I do use though is uh, either terpenoid, you can use lighter fluid or WD-40. Um, all of these are super abrasive, so you will break down the clay really quickly. Um, another use for solvents is if you're trying to clean something out, you can use the solvent to basically break down the clay and make it easier to clean out a mold, for example. Um, but I mainly use it for finishing and smoothing things out. Water-based clay, epoxy clays, and foam clays all use water as their solvent, so that's pretty easy, really easy to get, and it's not super abrasive in general. Um, this is specific, heat is specific to monster clay and Chavon clay. I use heat a lot because I prefer to use monster clay, so um, they have, the oil-based clays I use have a really low melting point and can be worked with the heat of your hands or melted using a clay warmer or a heat gun. Um, so I've got a crock pot here. It's from Goodwill, it was about $5. The crock pot I have on here is about $20. It's really easy to find something like that. You can use like a wax warmer sometimes. Um, you can make your own DIY warmer for 10 bucks. Um, or you can use a heat gun. Heat gun's kind of like targeted heat, so maybe it's, it's almost like a microwave concept not literally in that like you're going to heat something really fast um and so maybe that's not the look you're going for because it's going to melt it but um sometimes maybe that's the look you're going for i'm not sure so um yeah so i've got this crock pot here that i use um and i basically just go ahead and drop my clay in there um, usually I have kind of my bigger one in which I have like a Tupperware and then I have the clay in there so it's less cleanup you know, for me but um, basically uh, this clay is pretty pretty hard right now but if I work it it's going to make it a lot softer with the heat of my hands and if I need it even softer um, then I'll basically take one of these ribbon tools get a bunch out of this here put it in here and I'll wait a couple minutes for it to warm up um, and just kind of be less firm. You have to keep an eye on it because you don't want to make monster clay soup, mm -hmm. uh, which I have done many times because then it's kind of useless unless you're going to melt it down to pour into um, a mold or something like that. I'm usually not doing that. I'm usually um, building something. So yeah, just keep an eye on it. Make sure you're not nuking it. Armatures and supports. So for larger sculptures, with especially with non-hardening clays, you need to use some sort of support on the inside. Um, just to support the weight of the clay. It's really dense, it gets heavy. Um, and you can use anything for this, really. You can use a armature wire, like literally it's called armature wire. You can use PVC pipe, which I've done before. Um, you can use tin foil if it's like a small piece. I've done things where I've, I'll build something out of tin foil and I'll sculpt on top of that. And it just saves less time for you. Um, you don't have to make it super dense and you can just do what you need to do really quickly without like putting a ton of clay down. Um, the cheapest thing you can use with clay is your hands, your fingertips. Um, I have long nails right now and I don't recommend that, so cut your nails um, if you're working with clay, otherwise it's gonna get in your nails and get kind of gross and crusty. Um, but your fingertips are really good for smoothing, they're really good to create depth, they're really good to move clay around. Um, and smooth in general. Ribbon loop tools, these are my favorite tools to use. I'm gonna pass a couple of these around. Um, basically these are tools with like a metal ribbon at the end. Um, these are, you'll notice these are double-sided. Um, and this is used to remove material from your sculpture. And I use these, actually take these as well. Sorry, Brie. Um, I use these to remove material from the culture and kind of let a sculpture and kind of carve into this. Um, and it creates depth. Um, smaller ribbon tools can be used for details like wrinkles um, and texture in general. Um, this tiny, tiny one is one of my favorites to use just to create different varying degrees of depth. Um, super, super small details with that. And I have an example right here on one of the, on the right side, is it your right or my right? I'm not sure. But you, get, you guys see what it is. Uh, so there you get different ribbon loops and they create different shapes. 
You can make your own as well. It's super cheap to do so. You just get some wire and a piece of wood and something to clamp it down and then there's your tool. Um, they don't have to be expensive. Next favorite tool are what I call a ball tool. So these, you also can find these in nail kits. So this has a double end. It's got a larger ball on the top and a smaller ball on the bottom. Uh, and I use these to push clay around and to um, like stitch chunks of clay together. Um, you can also use this to create uh, texture or add depth. Um, it is kind of just like a ball at the end, so you can create like a hammered look using this as well, um, where you can use it to make holes, as you can see in the picture, um, or create depth, as you can see like right below that, that hole. Um, Rubber shapers, so I only have a couple of these because they did not fit in my kit. Mine are very large. Um, so these are multi-use art tools. They're not specific to sculpting, but I like them a lot. Um, you can use these to push clay around. You can use them to smooth. They're really great for softening, softening up harsh details and creating depth with where your fingers can't reach. So for the most part, I use my fingertips to get into like little crevices, but in the case of like having really, really tiny details and crevices, I, this, this tool specifically, I use a lot just to create like, get in, really get in there and smooth things out. Um, typically, I'll use these after the ribbon tools. Um, I've already created and carved something out, and I'll be just going in there and creating more depth using this and smoothing some of those pieces out. These are also used in nail kits for acrylic nails. You can find them everywhere. Um, they're not, like I said before, they're not specific to sculpting, um, but they're a very pop popular tool for sculpting. Um, wooden and plastic tools. So these, you can find these at any craft store. They're usually super, super cheap. Um, you don't really need them. These are just kind of tools that I have accumulated. I have like this bunch of them here because they're super super cheap and sometimes you just need a certain shape and I find that you get a lot of weird shapes in the plastic or the wooden tools and so they're really great for creating like really shallow detail and some smoothing and there's so many different types like you can just get a pack of 20 and then you'll you'll find use out of like three of those tools at least and you can get it for like two bucks so I really like the plastic and the wood tools just because I I'm kind of really obsessed with different tools you can use with clay, but um, they have, they're super, super versatile and they're super cheap, which makes it even better. So starting sculpting. Now that I've talked about all the tools and materials and types of clays, I want to talk to you guys about how I approach sculpting and how I start to create a costly piece out of these things. Um, so the first thing I do is gather a bunch of references, as you do in your cosplayer in general. You gather a bunch of references, pictures from all sides, source material, basically. Um, and I also, when I'm sculpting something, because it's such a 3D element, I also um, get a bunch of real-world textures and pictures as kind of like inspiration. Um, and I'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, your references and your sketches, I also put sketch up here in the title because sometimes the reference isn't enough, sometimes I need a, like, a little bit more information, I need to figure it out, and so I'll, I'll make a sketch, as you can see on this here. So the sketch doesn't really look very similar to the sculpt, but that's okay because I know what it means. So it doesn't have to be pretty, it just has to get the point across to you for you to understand kind of how you're going to build this thing. Um, in that sketch, if you choose to go with a sketch, you should be showing your, your depth and your detail, where it's like how, how deep is deep, um, how shallow is shallow. Um, and then you want to, if you can, uh, create it at scale, if it's, if it's small enough, if it's something very large, obviously create a thumbnail version of it, um, and maybe separate different sketches showcasing different pieces um, of how you want to build that. But, um, if it is small enough, definitely do it to scale because there is a trick that you can do where you basically take um, your clay and then your sketch and then put a piece of wax paper on top and you've got your sketch underneath and you just basically start blocking out your, um, your basic sketch with your clay and then you move that over and then you block 
block out your next layer of details, um, your next layer of depth, and then just kind of go from there. So it gives you a really good starting point to kind of go ahead and start your sculpt. So I'm going to talk about my process when I made Mauricio's mask and some of the things that I looked up when I made her mask. Um, so this is an Oni, Oni mask, a Hanya mask. I started by looking up a bunch of different um, Oni masks and Hanya masks for inspiration. This is literally the only image I had. It's from like the character sheet. I looked up images in the anime and the manga and I just could not get a really good um, screenshot. So we have this um, and so I kind of took a bunch of inspiration from a lot of different references to kind of arrive at, at this. So I didn't really sketch for this one. Um, I just gathered a bunch of different references and kind of pulled where pieces that I liked and started from there. So these are a couple of my references. Um, and yeah, and I started on the basic form. So you can't really tell. Um, I don't have the actual sculpt with me, but I went in, I went to Michael's and I bought a mask, kind of like a full mask that goes over your face like this. Um, it already had basically like eyes and a nose and a mouth. Excuse me, and so I covered that in um, paper tape and, and packaging tape to cover up all the holes in there, and that's where I started with, with my basic form. So that was my structure, so to speak. Um, and so I basically covered that in clay. Um, so when you're when you're building your base form, um, clay is very add and subtract. You you don't want to spend a lot of time on the base form. You really just want to get um, the basic pieces down. You want to start with really broad details um, and you want to start building in your depth at the very beginning. So there's two methods to do this. As I said before, it's, it's kind of like an add subtract me method. So um, you can start additive where you start just building out the high points and then fill in the low points afterwards or you can start with a lump of clay and then carve and remove clay as needed. I tend to do both, but I lean towards additive, so I'll start with a very simple base and then build the depth as I go. Um, but subtractive is, is good if you're used to carving um, things out of foam or things out of a harder material, that might be something that you are more comfortable doing. But at the end of the day, it's a little bit of additive, a little bit of subtractive. So here is the start of Rachel's mask. Um, it's not very pretty, but that's okay because this is this is a really good starting point because I already know where my eyes are, I know where my eyebrows are, I know the high points of my eyebrows, the nose, and I know where the mouth is supposed to go. Um, the cheekbones are also in there and I have very like, rough placement of the ears and the hairline. The next, the next piece of this, and by the way, this took me maybe um, 30 minutes, 30 minutes to an hour, and that's a long time. You want to go through this really quickly. You don't want to spend a lot of time here. Um, your, your main focus here is to get the depth right and get the details blocked out. The next step is refining. So this is where you want to do your fine detailing. Uh, you're smoothing, you're making sure things are symmetrical, and you start adding texture here as well. So I've got a close-up of the ear here because I'm super proud of it. Um, but basically, I started with a block of the ear, just those high points, and then started carving and refining as I went. Um, here's another refinement stage. It's a little bit smoother than it was before. And then um, that took me maybe a couple of hours. A lot of time was spent on the refinement stage. And then the final form. So. Finally, just kind of finish the sculpture off. Um, you'll be doing a lot of your smoothing here. Um, this, this is where the solvents come, come in play, where that's, I use solvents primarily to smooth things out um, and add texture if I need to. There's also, for oil-based clays, you can use canned air. Um, and so what I do is I, so you, it's got a low melting point, right? So it, it's, when it's really soft, it's kind of melty because you melted it. When it's really hard, it's because it's kind of cold, right? So you put it in the freezer to get it really, really hard. Um, and so to instead of putting this giant thing in my freezer, uh, maybe it doesn't fit in your freezer, 
um, I use canned air. So the way you get freezing air out of canned air is you turn it upside down and you spray. So that'll give you really concentrated freezing air to basically freeze your monster clay. Um, and if you're not using monster clay, you're using something else, then you need to prepare to bake or self-cure. Air dry um, depends on the material. So this is uh, what it looked like before it went through the mold process. Um, you can see, uh, this is quite, you still see some brush lines where um, I used a brush to apply the solvent, um, and so I was trying to get that as smooth as I could. Um, Do you have a question? No, it's mine. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Um, so it's pretty smooth at this point. Um, the next, the next step here for me, using the monster clay, was to go ahead and mold it so that I could cast it in a plastic. So the finishing step basically depends on material. If it's self-cure or air dry, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, or if you have to bake it in the oven, um, that'll be the next step that you have to do. Um, I have optional on here for molding and casting. For me, for Mauricio's mask, it wasn't optional, like that's what I needed to do. Um, but no matter what, whatever you're, whether you bake it or you're molding it or you're casting, you still need to sand, fill, and paint it um, at some point, whether that's your master sculpt or your, um, your finished plastic piece. So with oil base, obviously you have to mold, cast it, sand, and fill, and paint it. So I'll talk really quickly about the molding and casting piece of this. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about silicone molds. Who was in the last panel with Allison about molding and resins? Okay, there's a lot of you. So I feel like that was a really good primer for what I'm about to talk, talk to you guys about. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to make molds. Um, there's a lot of different ways to make silicone molds. Um, and you typically choose the method based on the project and the shape of what you're trying to mold and cast. So the methods that I use um, for this and, and the examples that I'm about to show you are um, I use a brush on mold and I slush cast and I create a mold jacket and I, and I slush cast. I'm also using a tin cure silicone called Rebound um, to do all that because uh, in order to mold with the monster clay, the monster clay is sulfur free, which means you can use it with a tin cure silicone. Um, if you use platinum cure, it's not going to work. So here are some pictures of the molding process on some of the pieces that are in the museum. Um, there are, there's like the skull and the foot armor on one side and then that giant claw arm I showed you guys before. This is creating um, kind of the silicone mold, and I used a brush on silicone to do this, and you apply it on in, in layers, um, and you build up kind of a thick-ish um, silicone this way, and then the way I did it, which um, is a little bit more complicated than just making a one-part or two-part mold, I had to make kind of like a mold jacket, so you create that silicone mold, and then you also have to create um, a piece that goes on top of it, to basically keep that silicone mold in place. I don't know if I have any pictures of it. I do. So the mold jacket is basically there to keep that silicone in place so that when you do slush cast it, when you do put that resin or that plastic in there, it's going to, re it's going to retain the same shape it's supposed to. Um, silicone is very floppy, especially the kind that I use to make this. Um, so you want, you want that uh, structure, that mold jacket, to be really, really rigid. Um, and I, the different things that I use for that is you can use plaster bandages, you can use fiberglass resin. I don't recommend that for a beginner. Um, and you can also use something called Plasti Paste from Smoothline. Um, that's one of my favorite things to use. It's really easy to set up. Um, it gets kind of spiky, but there are ways that you can um, make it a little less painful to hold on. I believe it's acetone. You can put on acetone and it will kind of smooth it out. But I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and some things that you use to create the mold jacket are like clay and like tin foil. These are called like mold walls. Um, and then I also have what's in plastic paste and I'll, I'll go into that here. So this is the process that I had to go through for my, for Pierre Omega's arm. So this is an arm that she has, she's gonna wear like this. And so 
I needed to create something that had that had like a positive inside, and like I need that negative space on the inside. Um, that's why it's super, super complicated, and I had to do this in two parts. So the, the actual silicone mold of it is just like kind of like a sleeve on top of the actual sculpt. And so to release the master sculpt, you have to cut a seam down the center. So there is a seam on the end result, you have to hide that seam. So you cut that out, and then you put them back together. And then you have that plastic paste, I use plastic paste in this case, mold jacket, and then you put that on top. And then there's um, where I poured the plastic was from the bottom. Um, can't really see it here. But you pour the plastic in the bottom and you kind of slush it around. So Pure Omega's arm was not made out of plastic. It was actually made out of silicone, so I had to cast silicone within silicone. So I used two different types of silicone. I used a skin-safe silicone called Dragon, Dragon Skin, and I used a different silicone, um, and the name escapes me at the moment. I might remember later. <laughs> Ask me if you're curious. Um, and so you need a special release for silicone on silicone, and it's a specific silicone specific um, mold release. So you have, basically you just have to be really, really, really careful because if you don't apply it in every single space, which is hard with the spray, um, you may risk ruining the inside, the mold and the mass, and the, not the mass, the mold and the actual thing that you are creating. So the risk is really high. So what I did was I, on recommendation of the guys from Smooth On, was sprayed it all the way, sprayed this release in the mold, and then also sprayed my paintbrush with it and just like went in there with like a paintbrush to make sure every nook and cranny was was um, was covered. And so I did the same thing with the silicone that I would have with plastic, which I basically slush casted. So slush casting works by, um, there's like a gel state um, there, and so you basically, you pour this in and then you pour out some of it, and you pour in a little bit more and you kind of keep turning it, you cast it, you kind of keep turning it until it kind of gets a little gel-like consistency in there. And at some point, it will, you keep turning it, at some point it will solidify and that's when you can add your second layer. So slush casting that way, it takes a, a, a hot second, it takes a while. Um, and so you, you kind of keep building it up in layers until you feel like you have enough layers that if the plastic or the silicone or whatever you're casting in, um, or whatever you're casting it out of, um, is thick enough for your liking. So it's kind of tricky. So Rubicio's mask is a little less tricky than that arm thing that I showed you. Um, so here you can see the silicone mold with some rubber bands around it, and there's that white thing around it, which is the plastic piece um, kind of jacket. And so it actually kind of like, um, this is very wide, and the rubber bands actually help make it a little bit skinnier, which is the kind of look that I wanted. Um, and so the same thing applies to the slush casting with plastic instead. So you do have to use a certain type of resin, uh, sorry, plastic for this. Um, I believe it's Smooth Cast 300 Q. Um, get back to me on that. But uh, you pour a little bit in, you mix part A, part B, pour a little bit in, and keep slushing until you see it solidify. Um, and then just keep adding your layers, keep adding your layers. It's really easy to see with the smooth cast, with the with just like plastic, because you can see it cure, it turns white. It goes from like no color to color. Um, the silicone is really hard to see because there's virtually no color change. So you just, if it's still moving, then it's not cured. If it's, if it's not moving yet, so. Um, so yeah, okay, so I have a couple of resources that helped me while I was learning how to sculpt. Um, Stan Winston Studio has a website called stanwinstonschool.com. Um, I really recommend Don Lanning. He has like a free, like you can find it on YouTube too, like a free, like really quick um, tutorial on sculpting with Monster Clay. Um, and then there's also a book that I recommend, which is what this image is from, and some of my images are from, called Beginner's Guide to Sculpting Characters in Clay. Um, and if you're interested in special effects and molding and casting any further, I really recommend the YouTube channel, uh, Reynolds Advanced Materials and uh, Smooth On. They have YouTube channels with lots of tutorials on them. 
Um, and if you're if you're a book person like me, I also recommend Special Makeup Effects for Stage and Screen um, by Todd Debrseni. I took a class similar in, co in college, and I learned a lot of those things in college. Um, but um, those are my top recommendations, but there's a lot of information on molding and casting and special effects and, and sculpture in general online. So just search YouTube, search Google, and find some of this stuff. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any questions, please let's connect online. I've got Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I've also got a website. I have some um, business cards up here. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and open the floor to questions. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> what kind of armature did you use to make So I didn't use an armature, uh, but the closest thing that you could call an armature was a um, plastic base mask. Oh, right, right. So I covered that in tape. Um, just so that I wasn't sure if it would, if the clay would stick to the plastic, so I covered that in tape, um, and that was that was my base. And I built up on that. I think there was a question back over here. <laughs> um, how do you keep the clay from uh, your grannies as a small detail or a case? How do you keep it from like, growing against your skin and you potentially ruining it? Um, what kind of clay? So the monster clay, you have to mold in class, so the final product isn't actually going to be made out of clay, it'll be made out of a plastic. For, but for the case of like a sculpey piece, or um, something like epoxy sculpt, um, I don't, there's not usually really any issues with those, it doesn't break down to be a sweat or anything like that, um, but I think something like foam clay, or model magic, something like that, will probably probably do that. Um, so for those types of things, I suggest having like a barrier between your skin and between um, yeah the the piece, like a piece of foam or a piece of felt. Um, did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. Definitely the arm, because it required a lot of different skill sets that I didn't have at the time. Um, it was a very big learning experience, um, and I learned a lot about silicone um, and different types of silicone with that project. So yeah, definitely the most complex thing that I've made. Speaking of the arm, so I'm just trying to understand what exactly you did. So. You, you had a model of, your, of the arm, you built up on top of that with the clay, and then to make sure that there was enough room in there for the person to get their arm inside, it was just because it was slush cast that's what made the room? Basically, yeah. So I did start with um, a plaster copy of my friend's arm. I didn't actually wear it, I made it for a friend. So we started with a plaster copy of her arm. We mounted it on uh, like a PVC armature structure type of thing. So we had that negative. Um, Positive? Negative, I'm not sure. But we have that piece and I built everything on top of that and I made sure that the clay was about like a couple centimeters away because I knew that the dragon skin had to be um, durable and it's durable because it's got lots of different layers. Like the thickness is what makes it durable. So I knew, I knew it needed to be a certain thickness and so I just made sure that the clay represented that amount of thickness. So yes, you're right in that um, it was a little bit of a guessing game um, as I built up the thickness using the slush cast. I just kind of had to use my eyes and hope that it was fine. Um, it, the project actually did, uh, in a few places, was a little bit too thin, so it did tear. But it's easy re easy to repair with like silicone glue and pigments and stuff like that. But it was kind of like a learning curve. Um, there is a way to do it to where it is more um, I don't want to say mathematical because that's not the right word, but it, it's more like a, you can use matrix molding and it's very, if you do it correctly, it will be a perfect fit. Precise. Yes, it'll be more precise. That's the word I was looking for. Um, so if, you, if you're looking to do something like that, matrix molding is the way to go. It has got a little bit more of a learning curve than what I did. Um, but yeah, there are resources online on how to do that too. For the RPC cut a slit to put it on, right? 
For the arm piece, I cut a slit to get the mold, or to get the master out of the mold. So then I could um, create or put back together. Let me rephrase this, because I feel like I didn't do a really good job explaining it in the first place. So the reason I needed to cut that, cut into it is because um, to get that silicone peat new mold that I made, I needed to break down what was inside. Just pulling it off wouldn't have worked because it's so tight to that mold. So I had to cut down, um, cut a seam into it to take it off of the master. Um, that all happened after I created the mold jacket and everything. So um, I already have kind of like that, that piece that um, will fill in kind of like all the gaps. So um, after, that's like the last step. And so before I poured everything in, cut that slit in, put it back together, put that mold jacket on top, and then I have my thing that I'm going to, that, then I have my completed mold basically. That makes sense? Yeah, the silicone didn't have a slit then. So the silicone had a seam, but yeah, sure, right? It didn't have the slit, but it had a seam that it had to go in and fill. So um, I didn't actually, now that I think about it. <laughs> I was able to hide it with texture, but the way you fill it is that you, um, there are silicone pigments called silk pig. Um, and there is a kind of like, a, there's the pigment, there's like the actual paint and the color part of it, and then there's the silicone like additive. And together those make the silk pig. Um, and so what you're supposed to do is that you, you take the silk pig and you can use that as a filler, much like you would do with like filler primer or um, filler putty. Um, and then you're supposed to go in and um, add that detail on top. It's, a, it's not a very, easy process because you've already got your depth and your your details all there already so you have to kind of go in with like you can go in with like a stick or like one of these tools and like build in some of that detail to kind of hide the seam um, but that's how you do it um, i was lucky in that i didn't really need to do a lot of work to hide the seam because it kind of hid in all the details but yeah okay thank you <laughs> any other questions so I've made the, a positive of a year, and I wanted to know about how, do, how would you go about building a year and then making the, the actual final product? An ear in the, what kind of ear? Whose ear? So like a... Like a human ear or a cat ear? So I have a positive of my ear. Okay. I want to make a, an attachment so that... Like an elf ear? Yeah, like an elf ear. Yeah, okay. Um, and you're asking, how would you mold that? So, I, I have the idea that you put the clay on it, but how would you go about finishing the product afterwards? Making that um, actual copy of it? Yeah. So you'd have to mold it. There are a couple of ways to do it. It depends on kind of the shape that you do it. Um, that's a really tricky thing to do, just because there's, there's stuff there. Um, but you can create a one-part mold um, of using like glue or something like that. It depends on what clay you're using too, because um, silicones don't always play well with clay. If you use like a air dry clay, let's say you use Sculpey or um, epoxy sculpt on top of this, then you can use glue or something like that. Um, basically, you make a mold wall around it, make a one-part mold, fill that with um, the silicone. And then once that cures, flip it over and take your ear out of this. Um, if you're using Umu, if you're using something really dense and not super flexible, then you'll have to cut a slit in it to be able to release the mold. Um, if you're using something super flexible like Dragon Skin or Rebound, um, both by Smooth On, then you don't have to do as much. You might, but um, you can do something similar to what I did and kind of like make like a mold jacket. There is a specific way to do exactly what you're asking. I haven't had to do it, so I don't know. But look online, look at how people cast elf ears, because I guarantee you you'll find a perfect tutorial for doing it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Well, if you guys want to come see my tools and my silicone molds and play with the clay, you're welcome to come up and, and hang out.